Hello everyone, and welcome to some playing around with Immortal. Also kind of introducing it because I realize not everyone who's going to be watching these videos is super familiar with the game. So I figure it's a good idea to maybe go over the game a little bit. Like, just give some basics just so that when tournament footage and so forth comes up, it's easier to follow and kind of understand what's going on. So we're going to do exactly that. Join me as we explore the game of Immortal Gates of Pyre. So, first thing that happens every game of Immortal Gates of Pyre is that you start out, you pick an Immortal. So, this is a very important thing to bear in mind. The way this game works is that, like most strategy games, you have factions. You, you pick your faction at the start, that tells you what you're going to do. In Immortal, there's a couple things that go both above and below that. Above that, you have the concept of faction families, which aren't currently implemented, but you can think of them as there being kind of broader mechanical similarities between factions, even though they are otherwise distinct. So at this point, we don't really have a clear example of this. There's some examples in some of the prototype games. I'm not sure they're going to map out, but it's still important to keep that in mind because it will be mentioned. The more important and salient thing that is actually in the game so far is going the other way, sub-factions or immortals in the case of this particular game. That's the actual name of it. So each faction, in this case Karoth and Aru are both factions, have multiple immortals. Each immortal has a few different things that change things up. So, each faction has a baseline set of buildings as well as a baseline set of units and upgrades. Like, everything's kind of baseline. But, they also get some modifications. So that you have kind of like raw Karoth, raw Aru with a bunch of units and buildings. Then you'd say, I want to play Orzum. Well, Orzum will replace a couple of units as well as add a couple of abilities because there's also a kind of activated global ability system. Each immortal has the ability to produce towers that just defend an area of keep sight on it, as well as the infused troop ability, which essentially just spends pyre to make units stronger briefly. Then each immortal has a bunch of unique abilities two or three unique abilities that it's not complete yet but the idea is they have these first two are universal these other ones are more immortal specific and of course as you can see here there's a passive on top of that so each immortal also has a passive the most important thing though is the units they replace because they replace a couple units those units then may have different researches associated with them or may require different tech buildings in order to build and in general, it changes up how the Immortal plays. For the purposes of this first game, let's start out with the simple, or the Immortal considered to be the simplest, which is Orzum, just to kind of show the basics. So you pick an Immortal, again, essentially a sub-faction. So you pick your faction, pick sub-faction at the same time, and then that determines how the rest of the game is going to go. So when you start, you win! No, it's just a solo play thing. When you start out, you have a. I can't deal with this. When you start out, you have a. Your main base. You start out with a scout unit right away, so any Age of Empires player is going to be familiar with how that works. And you start out fully saturated. You also start out with this Bastion building, which is very important because this building produces alloy. You have two resources that are you build your base around. Alloy and Ether. Alloy is gathered from these little troughs. Ether is gathered from these holes in the ground. And those two resources are what is used to build everything. Anything you see in blue and purple, that's Alloy and Ether. Or sometimes Alloy alone. It's never Ether alone. These are what make the game tick. So, you start out, you get your built base mining, you get the Bastion mining, cool. And of course you have scouts, you can send them out to do stuff and scout, see what's going on. Which is of course very important, because you need to know what's happening. As in any strategy game. So Immortal just gives you a bunch of easy, or Gates of Pyre, it's called that. Gates of Pyre gives you a bunch of easy ways to actually do that. Now... Obviously, you want to build stuff, and a neat thing about this game, which is worth noting more from a play perspective than from a spectator perspective, is that there is a button that gives you a tab that lets you build stuff by just selecting whatever worker is nearest and currently inactive, and then using that, which is really convenient. So you can just kind of 
go around and build things and build things and build things and like bam all the workers just go and build stuff so it's kind of this hybrid system of command and conquer and any craft like games where you have the tab that selects what you build and it's kind of a global thing but you are still using workers to build it also worth noting the workers do build automatically it's the one thing in the game that uses a kind of flow like resource system where you it just drains over time Everything else in the game, you have to spend the resources you currently have. So for all the people who've been watching for a while who are familiar with Zero K or Spring Engine games or Total Annihilation style games in, in general, a very dis important distinction here is that this is not a flow-based economy, except when it comes to the construction of new workers. That is the only exception. In every other way, you only get to build units that you can currently afford. This costs 100, 100 alloy. I currently have... 396 alloy, you see a tick over to 400, I'm able to build four. The number in the corner means. So I can go build a bunch of these units. The Zantari, the frontline unit. This is actually a, one of the units I mentioned earlier, specific to Orzum. And if you build military units, what you end up getting is the ability to gain the third resource. You see here, Pyre. Pyre is a resource gained by killing towers that you find around the map. These derelict towers that are popped around as well as a resource that you get from killing pyre camps which you generally find in the center of maps it's it varies but as a rule wherever you see this little six pointed star thing with a little hexagon in the middle like the little hexagram with the hexagon in the middle that is generally and then kind of spirally designed in the middle then you'll find a pyre camp you attack them and the either they will but when they die, when all these units die, either you get this big pyre flame thing. I kind of want to show it, so do not gather yet. Get this little flame object. That is your main pyre pickup. You pick that up, you gain 25 pyre. And if you're playing in team games, your teammate gains 5. Alternatively, there are pyre miners, which give you an increased income over time, as you're, you do have a base income of 1 pyre every 3 seconds. So players do not get completely locked out of, that, out of abilities as they lose map control, but they get it far, far slower. And then this just increases that. So the main the main ways of gaining pyre essentially are getting up these pyre the pyre flames and getting the pyre miners. That's the two main things. And then of course killing these derelict towers that gives you a small amount, like ten pyre. And if you're wondering, how about those workers? You're talking about, you say, build them automatically. Well, how does that work for any kind of strategizing? The answer is, these town halls can upgrade. Specifically, they upgrade the alloy cluster. So you can see right now, there's it's kind of blocked off. This is important to note from a spectator perspective. If this is blocked off, this can't mine that much. So you get the upgrade, and that upgrade will unlock a resource node. And then when that happens, you'll see that it'll start filling out. And when it does so... The alloy trough, I mean, starts filling out. When it does so, more things can be mined. More alloy can be mined in a particular period of time. It doesn't change the maximum at all. It still mines out as quickly. But you want more resources in a given span of time. That's generally how you win in these games. That's just another important thing to note. And the last thing is that tech in general works more or less along the same lines as StarCraft. You have different buildings that unlock different buildings. This does have a tech tree, rather atypically. For again, for those of you who are more familiar with Zero K, this game does in fact have a tech tree. Unit, buildings are required to build other buildings. Certain other buildings are required to build various units. There are buildings for Karath, for instance. Each each of these production buildings, you have your Legion Hall, you have a Soul Foundry, and then the Angelarium is your flying unit production structure. They each require each other in a line, and they also have buildings they build off. So if you see. There are going to be production structures. There are going to be upgrade structures. If you're familiar with how StarCraft style games work, or StarCraft Warcraft kind of games work, craft style games operate like this. So it should be familiar. For the people who are more familiar with Total Annihilation or Supreme Commander or Spring-based games, this is a bit different. So just worth noting that as a distinction. The other thing that's different, of course, is that you have a limit to the number of troops you can build. Again, unlike with 0K or Spring-based games, well... Okay, 0k in particular, spring based games vary. But unlike 0k, you do not get to just build stuff forever. In order to build things, you have to have an army supply cap available. You have to, the army supply cap has to be greater than your current used army supply. 
unlike in StarCraft, WarCraft, and so forth, you do not need a separate building. You don't need farms, you don't need houses, you don't need supply depots, none of that stuff. Every single production structure also provides 16 supply, which is enough for about four to eight units, typically. Really heavy units will require more than four supply each, but generally speaking, yeah, four to, like, three to eight units is typically what you'll get from a single production structure. And that is pretty much all the basics. Everything else is stuff that just sort of comes up in a fight. It's faction specific. It's things that kind of see over time. But otherwise, that is essentially what makes Immortal Gates of Pyre what it is separate from 0k, separate from... Well, it's completely unrelated to 0k, but those of you who watch 0k and familiar with it, those are differences you should watch out for. There is a tech tree. Resources are spent when you buy a thing, not gradually over time. Units require some kind of army supply in order to be built. They cannot be built just out of nowhere and for, like, nothing else. Of course, units also take a fixed amount of time to build as a result. And there's also upgrades for things. So units will get better over time based on upgrades that have been researched, which, if you're playing at least, you can kind of see in the corner here. It'll, it'll tell you if you've built certain upgrades or they have certain things. It'll, it'll, it'll let you know. Or, in some cases, what type of attack they're using, because many units have different modes of attack based on a variety of things. Zentari here gets a ranged attack when it's inside this hallowed ground range, which, for reference, is not required to build buildings. You can build buildings wherever you want as Karath. But it does power things up if they're inside of it. As for... And, of course, you have other units that will deploy into different modes, and you, it, it's a thing. So, it's just... Yeah, that kind of thing is much more much more like StarCraft. If you're familiar with 0k, it'll be a bit of a difference to watch. One thing that is similar, however, which is actually kind of funny, and I'm just going to go into god mode to make it faster, is that there is, in fact, a mechanic where some units will get something for staying still. Which, if you are familiar with 0k, should be very familiar. This is actually a thing in that game, too. Any unit that deploys a does some kind of like hold to fire type thing, will work like this. When it stops, it sets itself up. Crabs are like this. Halberds are, oh, when they don't attack, but crabs are like this for when they they get their big defensive boost when they're staying in place. It's a bit more varied in Gates of Pyre, but as an example, the Ark Mother will generate hollowed ground when they are in place for a few seconds. And there are units that will go invisible. There are units that will start building up meter a mana bar in order to start doing aoe damage there's some units that let's see what the other ones were there's aoe there was the stealth oh yeah some units will like set up areas of the ground that will reduce the amount of speed anything that has that going through it it's a variety of things so yeah this game for the most part, is going to be rather unfamiliar for anyone familiar with 0k. But there are some mechanics which do happen as kind of convergent evolution came to. It's kind of cool. I think that pretty much covers it. So now, let's go see about actually playing as another human being.